Welcome to the Behavioral Sciences section of our Practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 71 to 75. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 71, 72, 73, 74, and 75. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 71, it says a researcher has correlated data from a study. The results indicate that X and Y are strongly correlated. Which correlation coefficient would indicate the strongest relationship? So we know that X and Y are strongly correlated, stronger, strongly being the key word. And then we're looking for a correlation coefficient, which indicates the strongest relationship. So which one indicates the strongest relationship? The correlation coefficient can be between negative one all the way to positive one. So zero is the middle, and if you have zero, that means that there is no correlation between these two variables. If it's all the way at positive one, one being 100%, so think about this in terms of percentages. If it's 0.1, then that's 10%. So one is positive one is 100%, they're directly correlated. If x increases, then y will also increase but negative one going all the way to the other side is inversely correlated. So if x increases, y will decrease and vice versa. So we're looking at the strongest relationship. The key thing to keep in mind here is look for the greatest number, the one closest to either positive one or negative one. So that would be D. Don't just look for a positive number. It's the magnitude which matters. So D is the correct answer. In question 72, it says Terry is a Chinese exchange student living in the United States while he attends high school. When he tells his classmates and teachers he is Chinese, they often say, you must be good at math. This is an example of blank. So we have a student that's Chinese. When he tells his, his classmates, and he's living in a different country, so he's an exchange student, they say, you must be good at math. What is this an example of? So this would be option C, a stereotype which is a wild, widely held belief about a certain group of people, and it doesn't have to be something which is negative. It can be negative, which is saying that you know a certain group of people is more prone to committing crimes, for example. It can also be positive, saying that a certain group is good at things like math. So it is a stereotype because it doesn't necessarily mean that this individual is good at math, but it's a widely held belief. Even if it's positive, it's still a stereotype, so that's the definition. Option A is saying cultural differences, kind of, but it's not really hitting upon what specifically is going on. That's way too broad a term to explain what's going on right here. Option B, prejudice. You can't say it's prejudice because prejudice is usually something negative about a group, a belief that a, a, an individual has about a group, but a stereotype in this case, what's being said is positive. So it's not prejudice, prejudice and there's no harm or there's no harm intended against this group. It's just something which automatically has been learned by these students through the influences that they got, and they don't even think about it. And like prejudice can be the same, but in this case, what they've learned is a stereotype. It's not some something hateful or prejudiced. Option D, collectivism, is kind of irrelevant here. It's talking when the needs of the group are emphasized over the needs of an individual, but that is not even close to describing this scenario at all, so we can eliminate that answer, and C is the best answer. In question 73, it says a student believes that their performance on tests is due to luck and is not reflective of their understanding of the material or reflective of how, of how much effort they are placing into studying. This individual can be said to have a blank locus of control. So there's a student, they believe performance, so we're talking about performance on te tests, they believe it's due to luck, it's not reflective of their understanding or how much effort they place into studying. So what can we say? What type of locus of control do they have? If you're saying that other things and not the effort that you're putting in is indicative of the results, you have option A, an external locus of control. Whereas B, an internal locus of control would be the opposite. This person would say the results I'm getting are based on how much effort I put in and it's not luck at all. I made these results happen. Things like that would be an internal locus of control. And C and D are made up terms for locus of control. The main ones you need to know are internal or external. In question 74, 
It says a social scientist examines how student grades are affected by their teacher. Before the year begins, teachers in a study are told which students are very smart and which will need extra help using random assignment. What prediction could be made of students at the end of the year? So we are examining student grades and how they're affected by a teacher. So they are told which students are very smart, which will need extra help, and it's randomly assigned, and what prediction can we make? So randomly, teachers are told the student is smart or needs help, and it doesn't actually matter what the student actually is like. So that's why it's random. So you could have someone who's not that great at whatever subject we are studying, and the teacher is told that they're very smart, and based on research that has been done throughout the field of sociology, there is some evidence that the perception that a teacher has, it will begin to change their delivery of teaching, the delivery of the material, and that's going to change how the student learns and the marks that they eventually get. So based on the initial kind of thinking or prejudice that this teacher has about the student, based on whatever this belief this teacher has, that's going to affect the student's eventual outcome. So in this case, we're going to say option A is correct. Students identified as smart will get higher grades than the other students because those students probably got a, a better and a different style of teaching that was more helpful than other students did. Additionally, when the teacher is marking their tests, you know, they're looking out for things that are kind of close to the right answer. When teachers mark tests, they're usually just trying to match it to a key, the answer that they're looking for. If it's the smartest student, they might say, oh, I know that this student is smart, I know they understand the material, their wording might be a little bit off, but I can see that they're kind of hinting at this answer, so I'll give it to them. Whereas if there's a student that they believe needs more help, then they say, okay, I don't think the student actually understands the concept, even if it's a similar answer. They're trying, it seems like you can extrapolate that they're hinting at the right answer. The teacher will say, I don't think that the student actually understands the concept and that's what the whole test is about, so I'm not gonna give them those marks. So A is the correct answer. B is saying students identified as needing help will get higher grades than the other. No, they will not. They will have a different style of teaching, which probably is dumbed down a little bit or is more elementary than the instruction that the other students receive. And option C is saying there'll be no relation between the label of smart and needs help and grades, and that's incorrect because Research has shown that there is a link between what someone initially believes and how they treat their students, and it's gonna apply to other fields as well, not just education. And finally, D is saying grades will be based on academic ability and teacher expectancy will have no effect. No, there is a bias, once again, established in research. In question 75, it says, you once, once heard a loud noise while watching a spider, and now fear spiders. The spider is a blank. We're talking about classical conditioning in this case. So you heard a loud noise, you're looking at a spider, and now you fear spiders. So what can we say the spider is? Is it a stimulus or a response? Is it unconditioned or conditioned? So in classical conditioning, you initially have some unconditional stimulus and response. So the unconditioned stimulus was the loud noise, and the unconditioned response, which is your natural response to that, is getting scared because most people are just, you know, by evolution designed to be scared of loud noises. So that's your natural response. Then you have this class, this conditioned stimulus, which would be the spider, which you just so happen to be looking at in this case. So that kind of answers the question, which would be B. The spider is a conditioned stimulus. And then you have the conditioned response, which is your fear now of spiders. So that's what the conditioned response would be. So it's not the conditioned response, and it's not something unconditioned. So once again, unconditioned is what naturally happens. Conditioned is this new thing which has arisen based on classical conditioning. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here as well as in the description. And in that course, just like in this video, we go through a lot of questions and break down all the different answers so that you have the right type of thinking for the MCAT. And we also have lecture videos delivered by medical students and to check out everything else we have, follow the link. Here are some reviews for the course as well as our Instagram page. So make sure to follow us there for a lot more content. And that's it for the questions in this video. 
Subscribe here if you want to see more, and I'll see you guys in the next video.